Good evening. Uh, my name is Ian McFarland, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of the 2016 Holstein Lectures, a lecture series endowed by James Hulse in 1777, though, as is often the case with these things, the funds thereby released were not sufficient to actually start the lectures until 1820. Okay. <laughs> uh, as Professor Liu noted last week, in a context where it is customary to say that our speaker needs no introduction, in this case, that most shopworn of cliches uh, actually applies. In fact, if I may be permitted to cite that great icon of late 20th century pop culture, the film This is Spinal Tap, <laughs> I would submit that if one were to rate speakers who do not need an introduction on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, Professor Lord Williams would without a question uh, go to 11. <laughs> The theme of this year's lectures is Christ and the Logic of Creation, and last week we uh, began, as all good theology does, in medias race with the medieval excursion on the Christology of Thomas Aquinas, paying particular attention to the way in which Thomas's careful analysis of essay applied to the ontology of the Incarnation started us thinking about some basic features of the creator-creature relation. This week promises a step backward in time to look at some of the history that lies behind Aquinas. And with that in mind, please join me in welcoming Lord Williams as he speaks on the topic, defining the problem from Paul to Augustine. Thank you very much indeed. Last week, I began to outline what I hoped to achieve in this course of lectures in terms of using Christology as a way into thinking through how Christian theology clarifies the non-competitive relation between infinite and finite, between creator and creature. And I began, as Ian has said, in the middle of the story with an attempt to give you a sketch of how one of the most sophisticated Christologies in the history of theology takes shape and states the problem. And I ended last week with the question of, so how on earth did we get to that point? And this is my moving backwards to have a long run up at that question, beginning with St. Paul. Now, last week, I underlined the fact that Thomas Aquinas is very interested, quite simply, in language what it is we are in fact saying about this or that phenomenon. And his account of essay, the act of being, is not some kind of occult identification of a mysterious property adhering to abstract things, but a way of saying what we mean when we talk about something's existence in different contexts. But there's a sense in which the whole enterprise of Christology begins with problems of language. The earliest surviving sentences we have, which have Jesus or Christ or both the anointed or the Lord Jesus as their subject, the sentences written about him by Paul of Tarsus, exhibit a bewildering variety. Within a very short space, we may move rapidly from sentences of a kind that could apply to any member of the human race to other sentences that state or imply things that could not normally be said of any human subject. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Nothing eccentric about that. But within a few lines, Christ is said to have a body that must be spiritually discerned. And in less than a page, that body has been described as including baptised believers. A few chapters later, Christ, the anointed, who died and was buried, is spoken of as raised from death and preparing to return to the world. It is predicted that he will in the future defeat all forms of finite authority and deliver up a pacified and restored creation to God. At the very beginning of the letter from which these well-known phrases come, 1 Corinthians, the anointed Jesus is said to be active in preserving believers in their loyalty to him until he is manifested again in the world. 1 Corinthians 1, 7-8. In another letter, Jesus is said to be alive in Paul, Galatians 
He has been declared to be God's son, Romans 1.4, and is the medium through which restored relation with God is bestowed on human beings, Romans 3.22. He has died, and he cannot die again. Romans 6.9, he prays for us before the throne of God, now, 8.34. And it is a present fact that he loves us, 8.35 and 39. Galatians 2.20 speaks of the same love in the past tense. <coughs> Examples could be multiplied, but the point is clear. The range of activity ascribed to this subject, Jesus Christ, the Anointed, the Lord, in Paul's writing alone, is well beyond what's normally ascribable to a human individual. In a recent essay on the work of Christ in the New Testament, Michael J. Gorman lists ten functions or activities connected with the figure of Christ, ten ways in which Jesus is described as introducing characteristically divine activity into the historical world. What's said of this human figure is ultimately that, I won't give all of Gorman's list, that he is the agent of divine judgment, that he is the one who puts divine rule or authority into effect, through healing or exorcism or whatever, that he is the giver of the divine spirit and the recreator of the divinely called and constituted human community. And where his activity is recognized, there is new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. His active presence is associated with an entirely new frame of reference for perceiving human agency and human hope. And then there are enigmatic passages, 2 Corinthians 8 9, Philippians 2 6 8, implying that Jesus' human life on earth is a deliberately willed self identifying with the poverty or shame of human existence on the part of an agent whose life does not begin with his earthly conception. So all the questions of Christology begin with this deeply problematic and unusual set of linguistic habits to which Paul seems so addicted. They're visible, of course, in other New Testament writers, especially John. Here is a subject, a created substance, if you can retroject the Thomistic language we began with last week, a created substance of whom or of which things are predicated that are not routinely predicable of created substances or subjects. Now, New Testament scholarship has moved a long way from the era when the problem seemed to be how a blameless Galilean rabbi acquired a cluster of disreputable metaphysical or mythological attributes. <laughs> <laughs> Since the 1970s, at least, there's been systematic study of the intellectual and imaginative worlds of Jewish worlds of Jesus' day, and a recognition that there was in fact nothing all that remarkable about a certain merging of human figures with agents in heaven. Notice, by the way, my use of the word worlds, Jewish worlds of Jesus' day. The great heavenly mediators of God's action, the great angelic figures in whom divine presence and power reside, and the saints and intercessors of revealed history appear in profusion in the literature of the time. The Archangel Michael, Moses, Ezra, Melchizedek, and so on. There was nothing unusual in the idea of heavenly agents being manifest in history, or even in identifying significant leaders of the present with heavenly powers. So much is evident in various throwaway lines in the New Testament itself, Acts 5.36 and 8.10, for example. Simon Magus, you remember, is said to be identified with a heavenly figure. And we're told of the rebel Theudas that he claimed to be someone, someone with a capital S, I take it. But all this is amply confirmed by the evidence of apocalyptic and rabbinic speculation, not least by the strong reaction against the language of heavenly mediators in the rabbinic tradition after the first Christian century. 
a theme and area, of course, some definitively explored in Alan Siegel's groundbreaking book on two powers in heaven, and discussed pretty consistently since then. In other words, talking about Jesus in ways that exceed the compass of habitual speech about a human individual wouldn't in itself have been so very extraordinary at the time. What I want to suggest is that the really interesting problem is subtly different. Given that Paul and others have the option of identifying Jesus of Nazareth as the earthly embodiment and the earthly concealment of a distinct heavenly power, a distinct heavenly individual, why is this never quite settled in clear terms? Despite the ascription of supernatural power and pre-existence to the agency that's identified as Jesus, and indeed the trope of concealment in 1 Corinthians 2.8, Christ is hidden from the powers of this world. If they knew who he was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Despite all that, there is no qualification of the evident embarrassment of Jesus' judicial murder. On the contrary, this event, scandalous in different ways for Jews and non-Jews alike, becomes a paradoxical reinforcement for the credibility of Paul's message. The apparent weakness or implausibility of a proclamation that has at its centre an executed criminal is used as a kind of demonstration of divine power. Since this proclamation has no obvious human force or successfulness to commend it, it must be God alone who makes it credible. 1 Corinthians 1, 18-2-5 And the apparent passivity of Jesus as victim of divine violence is turned around, so that it appears as the supreme manifestation not of passivity, but of action. The supreme manifestation, in fact, of divine initiative. God gives Jesus to be a victim, but Jesus equally and freely accepts this vocation in obedience to God, so that his powerlessness may be transparent to God's act and power. God's calling of Jesus to his task, Jesus' acceptance of what that task entails, and the actual collision between the divine will and the diabolical rejection of it in the crucifixion are all inseparably bound up together. The point is that the identity of Jesus as human sufferer and the further identity of that suffering with the divine action are never eclipsed. And so they continue to unsettle the language of Jesus as straightforwardly the manifestation of a heavenly power or personage. If at the heart of this discourse there lies that identification of one particular moment of human vulnerability or passivity with unqualified, cosmically free divine action, it's a little harder to see what matters in Jesus as simply his manifestation of a divine individual whose glory and liberty lie in manifesting or mediating God to creation come back to that. And part of what we see in the earliest development of Christological language up to the end of the second century and indeed beyond is a continued unsettlement in which there is strong pressure all the time to accept the heavenly power model. A pressure which is repeatedly resisted initially in the name of the need to affirm without ambiguity the vulnerability of Jesus to suffering. A theme, for example, stressed very insistently in Ignatius of Antioch at the start of the second century. But at the same time, Paul sets in motion another trajectory of reflection with what's probably his most unusual idiom or idea. And this is his habit of speaking of actions or perceptions or the lives of individuals as being in Christ. Without going into the enormous scholarly literature about the roots of this way of speaking, it seems most likely that it's based in the idea that you can say that someone is in an ancestor. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews famously argues that when Abraham pays his tithes to Melchizedek, the patriarch Levi pays tithes to Melchizedek 
because Levi is already in Abraham's loins. Abraham's the ultimate source of the life of Levi and so contains his descendants' identity in potential. So Paul can argue that in Adam all have died, 1 Corinthians 15, and that, quoting Genesis, in Isaac all Abraham's children will be reckoned, Romans 9, 7. God's promise to Abraham is that in him all nations will be blessed, Galatians 3, 8 referring to three different texts in Genesis. And that blessing of nations in Abraham presumably means that they're blessed by their affiliation to or alliance with his descendants. So to speak, as Paul almost compulsively does, of being in Christ, suggests that Jesus is as much the source of a single community of kinship as Adam or Abraham the source of a single community of kinship, the source of a new human kinship, and the source of a more specific kinship among those who have received God's promise. To be in him is to belong to a kindred, a lineage. To be affiliated with Jesus is, rather surprisingly, like being a descendant of Jesus, deriving your own identity and the conditions and constraints of community membership from this common source. But the analogy doesn't stop there. To be in such an ancestor is to be able to claim that what he is doing, you are doing. Levi pays tithes in Abraham. Levi bows down in Abraham before Melchizedek. That's to say, to be in, in the sense to be in this kinship, is also to occupy the same space, to stand in the same relations. And in Paul's frame of reference, this means that aspects of Jesus' activity in time and beyond can properly be reckoned as our activity. Most dramatically, the conclusion is that the prayer offered by Jesus, Abba, Father, is our prayer. It's in Romans 6 and Galatians 4. And again, our trust in God is, in some sense, the same trust as Abraham's. We are spiritually Abraham's kin, Romans 4, 16-17. We are in Abraham. But the association we have as kindred of Jesus is even more radical an identification, since it allows us to be described as children not of Abraham, but of God, sharing the relation of Jesus to the God he prays to as Abba, Father. And, crucially, unlike Abraham, Jesus is still the active subject of diverse present verbs, as we've seen. He is alive to pray, alive to bestow grace on behalf of the Father, alive awaiting his return, and so forth. That's to say, if an ancestor, a source of kinship, also a contemporary, a context of a source currently, of life and action, active now. Paul's Christology assumes a very substantial complex of ideas which he's yet to assemble systematically. But so much of what I've just been describing pulls insistently away from the simple model of the manifesting of an angelic or supernatural individual on earth. Jesus as a version of Ezra, Moses or Melchizedek will not account both for the emphasis on suffering as divine action and the corporate kinship dimension we've just looked at. It's essential to recognise that what is being acted out in the life of Jesus is not a superhuman agency in any straightforward sense. It's vulnerable to struggle and pain, a point underlined even more starkly in the letter to the Hebrews. It is passive in the hands of human power. But second, it's essential that the identity of Jesus Christ is understood as generative of what I called earlier a lineage, 
a communal identity that allows its members to see themselves as gifted with the same mode of activity that belongs to their ancestor, so that his acts can be attributed to them as securely as Abraham's act can be attributed to Levi or the blessedness of Abraham ascribed to the covenant people. Now, the primary sense of this ancestor analogy is clearly receding fast in Paul's usage, simply because the idiom is becoming more and more pervasive for him, and he treats it more and more as self-explanatory. The very fact that it's perhaps unusual for us to step back and say, how exactly did anybody ever begin to talk about being in Christ? It tells us how much we've learned to take for granted, as Paul himself does, that particular development. But what survives is the focal conviction of action shared between Jesus and the community of which he is the fountainhead. So, as I've said, the implication of these two points, the focal character of the cross of Jesus, the incorporative way of speaking of Jesus' identity, the implication of these two points is that a number of possible accounts of Jesus are shown to be inadequate. Jesus as simply charismatic teacher or healer won't do. There's no evidence at all in Paul, and virtually none elsewhere in the New Testament, of any stage at which reflection on Jesus as teacher and example began to prompt speculative identifications with heavenly figures. In the New Testament we are always well beyond this. That's to say, we're never at that stage of argument beloved of some theologians of an earlier generation, where people said, Jesus is such a good teacher that he must be divine. <laughs> Equally, though, Jesus as embodied angel or re-embodied patriarch won't do. His actual human history matters too much. The specificity of his human history matters too much. A specificity which includes what you might call the theological trauma of his trial and execution. The scandal and embarrassment reflected notably in Galatians, where Paul boldly, audaciously, makes the very scandalousness of the cursed body hanging on the tree an argument for his theological case. Jesus' identity can't be translated without remainder into that of an apocalyptic or mediatorial figure of the kind Second Temple Judaism was familiar with, because what's left out or left over is the specificity of his crucifixion. And then again, Jesus as simply an individual in the past won't do. Not only is he currently active in heaven, but the kinship group of which he is the common ancestor is here and now, open to his agency and growing into a different kind of existence as a result of that agency, an agency which is appropriated to its human members. Jesus's human narrative identity, including his death, is understood as divine action. Not a witness to divine action, but that action itself. It is as human passivity that his death is divine agency. We need, though, to state this with care. Jesus acts so as to become passive, is, we're told, supremely free in his surrender to what is asked of him by the Father. He accepts his suffering as a choice. We're not saying that if he were active as a human, God couldn't act in him. That would take us right back to the competitive model of infinite and finite. We're saying, rather, that the presence of divine action doesn't depend on the inflation or reinforcement of human action to a degree of superhuman invulnerability and triumph. Hence Paul's arguments at the start of 1 Corinthians about the fallacy of assimilating divine wisdom or power to a maximal version of created capacity. Jesus as the power and the wisdom of God is not an inflated version of the power and wisdom we would all like to have not something measurable by the ways in which we measure human success in these terms. Well, I hope that that perspective on Paul's Christology 
may begin to throw light on some of the lines of continuity I've suggested between the highly developed discussion we find in the Middle Ages and the very origins of Christological language. My argument is, as I've said, that as Christology develops, it develops in setting out at greater and greater depth, with greater and greater complexity, problems of the relation between finite and infinite creator and creature. And what I've drawn out from St Paul is meant in part to suggest that that's not a problem idly dreamt up by underemployed metaphysicians in the Hellenistic world <coughs> or by friars in the Middle Ages with nothing better to do with their long winter evenings. There is already in the New Testament a refusal to treat the specific humanity of Jesus as episodic, accidental or incomplete. Already the conviction is there that this humanity in its entirety, in its unbroken entirety, is the form taken by the act of God in history. Already the acknowledgement of divine action here and now, exercised by and in Jesus, and participated, crucially, by those whom he calls into community. But as Christology develops, there is no simple or steady trajectory in the direction of the developed account, much more a series of local conceptual difficulties whose piecemeal solutions cumulatively pose the radical questions of the fifth century and afterwards. And that's largely because of what I've already referred to, the availability of apparently tidier conceptual frameworks for identifying Jesus. The range of what Paul proposes ranging from, as I've said, the insistence on the specific suffering of the cross through to the present activity and incorporative identity of Christ. That is rather too much for a good many early Christian writers to take on board and work with. And the most prominent and persistent of these tidy conceptual frameworks in the early Christian period is, of course, the various ways of talking about divine logos. Stoic and Platonic models, often mediated by way of Philo of Alexandria, exercised a powerful attraction, offering a structure in which Jesus could indeed, in effect, be identified with a pre-existent heavenly individual in whom divine power and divine ordering intelligence were mediated to the created world. The history of Christology, and indeed of Trinitarian theology, from the second to the fourth Christian century is largely a history of the negotiation of this cluster of images and ideas around Logos. And at the heart of that negotiation of ideas lies the great figure of Origen. For Origen, the divine Logos can be at times spoken of as something like a concentration, if not quite a reduction, of the divine into communicable terms. The Logos is as much of God as can be communicated to the finite, as much of the infinite as can actually be shared through a life that is not fully itself infinite. Origen works with a metaphysical pattern of a gradual weakening or thinning of being from its ultimate divine plenitude in God the Father down to the finite world, with the Logos as the first step away from absolute plenitude and absolute unity. But the paradox is that this kind of deeply affirmed and carefully thought through continuity between divine and created being leaves us stuck with another form of competition one kind of being which may be present in more or less effect, in greater or lesser quantity. The Father who has everything that belongs to true being, we ourselves who are a very long way down on the same scale. But that means that at any point, if you cut the ontological cake at any point, it will be the same being at work. Therefore, you will still have that problem about the degree to which 
one level and another can coexist. But what Origen does contribute is a very sophisticated account of union between the eternal and heavenly Logos and what you might roughly call the spiritual or intellectual identity of Jesus, the noose in patristic terms. Two points. One is that each one of us is, of course, an embodied noose. Each one of us is primitively, pre-cosmically, a contemplative intellectual subject currently leading a highly compromised, very uncontemplative and not very intellectual life, <laughs> even in the divinity faculty of the university. And so there is in each one of us an impassable, unchangeable, naturally contemplative energy at work. This is what connects with the eternal intellectual and contemplative activity of the divine Logos. And that at least allows Origen to say there is in Jesus a complete range of reality as it belongs to and is instantiated in us. There is, in the terms we were talking about last week, there is nothing lacking in the constitution of Jesus. We may not believe in pre-existent noes these days, but we will have an account of what properly belongs to a human individual as such. Origen is simply ticking off the requirements for being a human individual in his own terms. So he contributes that model of the impassable intellectual contemplative dimension of humanity as the medium through which the eternal contemplation and intellection of the Logos is united to humanity. And the second point related to that is that the unflagging adherence of the intellect, the noose of Jesus to the eternal Logos reflects and shares in the unflagging adherence of the eternal Logos to the Father. There is, in other words, in here, a model of shared action. The restored and liberated contemplative action of the spirit of Jesus is taken into the eternal spiritual life of the Logos. The human Jesus contemplates the Father in, through, with, in perfect association with and alignment to the eternal act of contemplation of the Father, which is the life of Logos. So there are some irreversible and important advances in Christological logic being made here. The case is made for the completeness, including the psychic or subjective completeness of humanity, even though the model still carries a disjunction between God as such and God in Christ, a disjunction between the essential soul and the embarrassing or dispensable body in Jesus, and ultimately, of course, the disjunction between the self-existent, wholly eternal Father and the Logos who is one step away from plenitude, as I put it. But without Origen's stress on the union of act between Logos and Nous, and the continuity of contemplative fidelity between the eternal Logos and the created Nous, crucial parts of the later Christological synthesis wouldn't have been available. And I would want to argue that for all the problems which Origen's Christology sets running, and they are many as we'll see in a moment, aspects of his theology nonetheless foreshadow something of the non-dual relationship between the Word and Jesus based on unity in act, which we've seen coming to focus in the theology of St. Thomas. Origen's Christology, I've said, started some problems running. And the crisis of doctrinal formulation in the fourth Christian century arises partly from a number of interesting and independent thinkers, prominently Arius of Alexandria, pressing further on the logical structure of Origen's picture 
You might put it like this. The question posed by Arius at the beginning of the 4th century was, is the divine action in Jesus direct or indirect? Is Jesus the act of God? Or is Jesus the act of the recipient of the act of God? Is Jesus, in some sense, responding to the act of God or embodying the act of God? Now, a theologian might very well say both and change the subject. <laughs> but Arius was not prepared to leave the question in that unsatisfactory state. If, in some sense, as Origen grants, the Logos is a step away from plenitude and unity, if the Logos is in some sense less than unequivocally divine, then the Logos is the object of divine action and the respondent to divine action. In Origen's scheme, that's not too much of a problem. Being overflows in plenitude from its source down all the various gradations of creation, and being reflects at every stage the plenitude from which it's come. Take away that, forgive the jargon, hierarchical univocity of being, the, the continuity of life that Origen takes for granted. Take away that, and you have a problem. A gulf between the unequivocally supremely active and free deity and any or every finite being who must be acted upon by God and responding to God. Arius wanted to resolve that problem in terms of seeing, definitively seeing, the Logos as precisely the first created response to God. Perfect, unbroken, faithful, radiant in glory, eternal for all practical purposes, but not actually the freedom of God itself or himself. After endless debate, as it must have seemed in the fourth century, the majority in the church resolved the question in another direction. They resolved it in favour of direct action in Jesus. The Logos was not a respondent to divine action, but the agent of divine action. The action, therefore, the divine action, the heavenly action at work in Jesus, is indistinguishable from the action that made the world. The Logos is unequivocally on the Creator's side, and so the divine action in Christ becomes inseparable from, or identical with, the entirety of the Creator's action. And out of this, of course, comes the second major clarification of the patristic period. Arius and some others had found it quite helpful to affirm the secondary nature, the non-plenitudinous nature of the Logos, because it allowed them to escape the embarrassment of Jesus being in some ways, manifestly, a finite subject. Jesus doesn't know things. Jesus is said to grow and develop. Jesus is said to suffer and even to question or to fear. For Arius, that was not ultimately the metaphysical problem it was about to become for the fourth century. The Logos, as created, was capable of all those things. But if the Logos isn't created, if what you're dealing with is unequivocally the act of God in and as Jesus, then you can't escape by ascribing suffering to a less than divine being. You have to make another kind of sense of the collocation of absolute eternal freedom and actual routine finite vulnerability. If, in other words, there's real suffering going on, then it's human suffering. But if there's human suffering going on in Jesus, are we now bound to say that it's God's suffering? And if we're talking about God's suffering, aren't we immediately infringing the rules of the grammar of divine being itself?
which does not suffer. Now, the detail of resolving that takes a very long time, as you don't need me to remind you. But the point I'm making here is that the 4th century is, in that sense, a period when compromises are being eroded, a period when the gap is widening. It's no longer possible to equivocate about where suffering belongs. It's no longer possible to equivocate about some kind of slightly inferior divinity being responsible for the embarrassing vulnerability that goes on in the life of Jesus. The fourth century is a polarizing period. And if you wanted to put it a bit epigrammatically, you would have to say that the affirmation of full unequivocal divinity for the Logos at the Council of Nicaea and eventually in the settlement of Constantinople 381 inexorably requires an affirmation of full humanity in turn. We're en route to the debates that finally led to the formulation of Chalcedon in 451, but I'll save you the details of that for the time being and just point out the double consequence of the 4th century debates. There is now an absolute distinction between creator and creation that is not just a hierarchical or a quantitative distinction. The creator doesn't differ from the creation by being a lot bigger. However sophisticatedly you might want to dress that up. The creator differs from the creation because the creator's mode of being is incomparable with the creation. And that in turn means that there is, back to the same point, no competition. The impassable and unchanging God, wholly free from finite or temporal condition, is established as one term of the argument. Not an exalted version of created being, but radically other to it. Not in a series or in a sum with other beings. And in a way, what I've been trying to argue so far in today's lecture is that it is ultimately Christology that forces that conclusion to come into clear focus by forcing the question of whether the divine act in Jesus is, as they say, connumerable with human acts, except in the most formal sense. The divine act in Jesus does not sit alongside human activity as another form of action within the world. Which is why when Chalcedon comes up with its two substance formula, you can see where it comes from, but you can also see why there are points it doesn't capture. Notably, the insight that we're not talking, speaking of humanity and divinity, about two isomorphic substances, two substances that work in the same way. More of that and the post-Chalcedonian arguments next week, but I did promise today to get on to St. Augustine at some point. And I wanted to introduce Augustine into the argument to round off today's um, exposition, because Augustine offers a rather strange alternative perspective in this whole story. He is a pre-Chalcedonian theologian. We sometimes forget that. He died before the Council of Chalcedon. He's also somebody who didn't know very much Greek. And he's somebody who, in his exposition and development of Christological themes, very often seems to be working with an agenda rather different from the specific doctrinal controversies of the 4th century, though he made his own contribution to those. His greatest contributions, in fact, to Christology arguably come from his exegesis. And as many have said over the years, it's to his discourses on the Psalms that you need to look to find the most clear and rounded expositions of his own Christology.
But once again, what is of interest is that Augustine begins from linguistic considerations. He reflects on his theology of Christ in terms not so much of what we are saying, but of what scripture is saying. And that's why when he speaks about the persona, the one persona, the unity of persona in Christ, we have to hear appropriately the resonance of the word persona as a speaker, a character, a dramatis persona. Augustine characteristically speaks of how God in Christ enacts or sustains a persona, agere persona, sustinere personam. He speaks of unitas personae, the eternal word of God, you might say, acts out a role in Christ. We may think that's a very inadequate rendering of what the mystery of the Incarnation is, but bear with it for a moment. The Word of God acts or activates or enacts or sustains a speaking part in the human world. Back to the notion of essay as active presence. The Word has a speaking part in the human world, and the speaking subject is what is continuous at the deepest level in the mystery of Christ. Augustine can express this sometimes in terms of the rhetorical technicalities of his day. Christ, the Word of God, is the right answer to the question, who is talking at any moment in the Gospel? And also the question, who is talking in a great many moments of the Old Testament too? The speaking subject is what is continuous. And that allows not only a very vigorous and very resourceful theology of how the unity of the Word's eternal identity in heaven is expressed through, communicated through the entirety of a speaking, intelligible, actively present human subject. It also, as we'll see in a moment, allows an equally resourceful and sophisticated theology of how we speak in Christ and Christ for us. Because in addition to Augustine's focus on the language of agere personam or unitas personae, the second major contribution he makes to the ongoing Christological exploration is his concern to theologize about the totus Christus, the complete Christ. That is the one who is not only divine and human, but divine and plurally human in his body, which is the Church. So, as you find in, for example, Sermon 341, the language of totus Christus allows Augustine to say, we talk about Christ in three modes, the eternal word, the historic incarnate presence, the ongoing body. And that is, as he says in one of the uh, tractates on the Gospel of John, that is the whole person, he and we. He and we. The whole person, he and we. Because that divine communication, the persona, which is the word, the speaker, becoming a speaker within the drama of human history, also speaks and communicates in the body that we are as church. As you see, it's a rendition of Paul's discourse about Christ's incorporative identity, with the added dimension of a rhetorical analysis. Hubertus Trubner's wonderful thesis on Augustine's Christology some uh, 30 years ago now, established once and for all the significance of these rhetorical questions, who is speaking to whom about what, in the shaping of Augustine on the Psalms especially. So the persona is the source of communication, as of other kinds of act, as such capable of being 
participated by those who communicate the same thing. As Christ's body, we are an aspect of how Christ is intelligible in the world. Just as Christ's literal, historical body is, the, is in its entirety the communication of the Word of God. There are parallels in Augustine with Origen, parallels in the way both see the soul as a mediating agency between the Word and the human body. Augustine's De Fide et Symbolo 410. But of course Augustine does not have the context of a pre-existent separation of soul and body as in Origen. The soul for Augustine is a necessary medium between word and flesh simply because the infinite word, God as such, cannot be joined to contingent flesh because the word can't substitute for the finite intelligence that is soul in us. You can't expect, as some fourth century theologians have tried to argue, you can't expect the word of God to step in in the gap where there ought to be a human mind. The word doesn't fit. The grammar is wrong. Not just the proportions, but the grammar is wrong. You can't make the second person of the Trinity do the job of a human subjectivity. Hence, soul, as intelligent, as loving, as self-aware, becomes the necessary mediating point between flesh and word. Not, as in origin, to get over the difficulty of somehow stitching together the impassable and the passable, but in this case, simply as an affirmation that the completeness of Christ's human identity, soul and body, is that which the word speaks. So that allows an avoidance of ascribing passibility to the divine person as such. Some very interesting discussions in 418, 419 with the Gallic cleric Leporius, who had embarrassed by formulations which seemed to ascribe suffering to the word of God, developed a highly dualistic Christology. He, was, um, he had a rather bad time with the bishops in Gaul, fled to North Africa, <coughs> hoping for sympathy. Um, Augustine took him in hand <laughs> and explains that you know, pastorally and patiently he got Leporius to see sense. <laughs> so much so that Leporius's confession of Christological doctrine was for a very long time ascribed to Augustine himself. <laughs> so passibility isn't something you just hang on the second person of the Trinity as if he were an inflated created subject. But at the same time Augustine is absolutely insistent, more perhaps than almost any other patristic writer, possible exception of Gregory Nazianzen, absolutely insistent on the reality of human experience, including suffering and choice. Again, you can look at his tractates on John, and you can look at the discourses on the Psalms. Pervasive in his work is the analogy of the soul-body unity itself as a model of personal union. We are two kinds of thing, soul and body, but one agent, one persona, one speaker, one intelligent presence. And that's, of course, an analogy popular in the Greek world, developed extensively by Augustine, repeated in the so-called Athanasian Creed and in a great deal of early medieval theology. It's one of those points, though, which Augustine, rather like the Chalcedonian formulation, suggests a slightly less helpful perspective by failing to affirm the asymmetry of the substances involved, but that's another story. Unity of person, unity of what is communicated and the act of communicating, the taking up of a human identity as a kind of word, a kind of speech, which is language that Augustine can use, and also therefore the incorporation of our speech into that speech. We are actively saying and doing what the word does. As for St Paul, the key to a great deal of Christological understanding is that we are 
enabled to say what Jesus says. In St. Paul, the crucial thing is that we can say what Jesus says to God. For Augustine, it's even more complex than that. We can trust that Jesus says to God what we say. We are equipped to say to the world what Jesus says on behalf of God, the Word. In the Discourses on the Psalms especially, the inclusion of all human experience in the event of the Word is very much to the fore. Human subjectivity at all its levels of uncertainty, confusion and even rebellion is included in the Word. Even moments of deep alienation from God or doubt about God are taken up in the communication that is Christ's action. If Christ is speaking throughout Scripture, not only in his earthly life, then he speaks the words of the psalmist protesting to God. He speaks the words of Job. He speaks to God words that come out of the depth of abandonment. And so human subjectivity is taken up into the word by being a vehicle for the communication of the word to the world and included in the words addressed to the Father. Christ brings to the Father all the protests, the cries of suffering, the moments of doubt and agony that human beings experience. So in Augustine, speaking and being spoken and being spoken for are all of them models of union, of union and continuity. Models that will problematize any simple division between solid subjects, a person in heaven, a person on earth, an individual in heaven, an individual on earth. As I've said, there is in Augustine's language an element of the theatrical, to the extent that you can say that in a drama, the character on stage is the character on stage, not the character plus the actor. You can't add character and actor. If you're watching Benedict Cumberbatch playing Hamlet, delivering a soliloquy, the answer to the question how many people are on stage is not two. <laughs> Augustine uses that as an image, not the Cumberbatch example. <laughs> he's working with something, something rather like that as a model. Left to itself, that could suggest still an external or artificial relation between the two. Benedict Cumberbatch goes home at the end of the performance, and Hamlet doesn't. But it's simply one dimension of a much wider and I think much more deep-rooted argument in Augustine about speech itself coming from God, providing the energetic principle of union in the event of Jesus Christ and the event of Christ's body, in which we are now participants. The voice becomes an image for the non-duality or non-competition I've been talking about. As I've hinted, Augustine's treatment adumbrates themes of the later 5th century, the language of Chalcedon, and some of what follows. And I'll move on to how Chalcedon both clarifies and further complicates discussion, and the new conceptual tools that were developed out of that argument. But my point today has been simply to show how Paul's plurality of language about this one grammatical subject, Christ the Lord, Jesus, and so forth, how that generates the major issues of patristic thought. And to show also how Paul's implicit and explicit refusal of two obvious options clears the space for later theology. Paul declines either the model of a continuous life for a heavenly individual that happens to have an interesting earthly episode, and he declines the model of a relation between an earthly or even a heavenly individual with a distinct act of God. <coughs> he continues to insist on an entirety of specific, unrepeatable human identity, including its suffering, with the divine action. That's what starts going the process of patristic reflection. <laughs>
And if we start with that model of human individuality, Jesus' individuality as it stands, being the agency of the divine, then that process of further reflection, however complex, however apparently at odds with what some people um, laughingly call the simplicity of St. Paul's doctrine, is unavoidable. <laughs> Thank you. don't have time for questions. However, uh, we've, uh, the uh, speaker has offered to take a couple anyway. So, uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to follow up on? Uh, on, the, on the... Some bonus time, people? <laughs> <laughs> Injury time. <okay. laughs> I mean, you talked about um, sort of linguistic uh, problems. I'm just thinking with Augustine specifically how sometimes he doesn't just turn to rhetorical examples but musical examples. And I'm wondering if you want to say anything more about that or mm. I, I have something specific in mind, but I'm just wondering if you want to use it as well. I, I shall urge you to say it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm more than favor of musical examples. I think that in preaching another reflection on this, that, that's the kind of analogy I often want to turn to. That um, the performer in the midst of the performance is, is the action of the composer. That is what the composer is doing. It's what the work is doing. The specific physical actions of sawing with a bow, striking with fingers, or exercising the vocal cords. That's what there is going on. So when um, use the example of often used Jacqueline Dupre is the one in Elvis Chelder. What is happening is in, well, that's this as much as come of action Hamlet, what is happening is not properly describable as the addition of one agency to another, but one agency totally animated by the structure capacitating of another action, which is the action of the creative artist who is in school position. But please go back to that. <laughs> no. uh, it, it introduces a problem, which is um, sometimes Augustine's uh, examples are less the performer um, when he turns to music, and, and sometimes it's a performer, but sometimes it's actually the instrument um, yeah. that, that the yeah. suffering of Christ is, um, is like um, Oh, that's right, the strings are yeah. tight, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. Perhaps one more passage in, is it the Arantia on 149? Um, there's one on Psalm 57. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Um, I think he's, he's doing different things there. Yeah. The instrumental um, things, I think, much more an ad hoc metaphor rather than a um, and it seems to get, um, there's a pseudo-Augustinian author then who kind of gets in trouble with it, which is he wants to define unity of operation as essentially the Godhead, and he takes Augustine's example of the, the Siddur and kind of makes the Trinity uh, something else. I won't, never mind. I won't elaborate. <laughs> so he sort of gets himself into all kinds of curious so, problems. <laughs> I, th I think when he, when he uses it in the Anorexionis, um, it's a way of saying, um, two things. One is, it's an appropriate image because the stretching out of human capacity to the point of acute suffering in the cross is how humanity, as it were, prepares itself for the touch of the divinity. Now, that's an uncomfortably dualist model in some ways, but I think that's what he's after. And it's, um, uh, often remarked on this is George Herbert, who's stretching seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so humanity is stretched out, pegged out, literally pegged out on the cross and nailed down. Humanity is stretched to its maximum, and the finger of God touches it. And he says, truth sounds forth. Then just resonate. Fantastic.
up Augustine, and you talked a little bit about um, Christ being divine and purely in his bodily church. How might um, you talk about Christ being purely human outside of the church, and where are the boundaries of that church? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I don't imagine Augustine would have been terribly sympathetic. But, but I think what he does is to give us a little bit of a, a cultivable seed there in saying that the unity of believers with Christ is, in some sense, their resonance with, with the persona, the speaking voice. Um, in seeing Christ's role as speaking to the Father resonating with human voices. I could imagine a theology which said if you wanted to look for the presence of Christ or the person of Christ or the act of Christ, you would have to listen for the resonance. You would have to see whether there was a life, a speech, a form of action which had about it something of the same resonance that we hope Christian life might have been. Yeah. And we've had an hour and ten minutes, more, much more than any of us deserve. <laughs> 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 Thanks for your time to uh, <laughs>